I'm going to be looking at 2 Kings, and I'm going to be talking about what a God we serve. But a little information about this book, it's 25 chapters, 719 verses, and 23,532 words. The first part of the book focuses mainly on Elisha, the prophet Elisha. Because in the first two chapters, you see the end of Elijah's ministry. And he passes the mantle down to Elisha. So, you read heavily about Elisha from chapters 2 to 13. Then in chapters 12 to 17, you read about the fall of Israel. And then 18 to 25 will focus on the fall of Judah. So, what a God we serve is going to be the main theme of this. What a God we serve. Chapter 1. Why fear man... When your God is a consuming fire. The God you serve is a consuming fire. And what happens in chapter 1 is the king sends his men to confront Elijah. And Elijah calls down fire from heaven on him. You know, he does it a couple of times there. Calls down fire from heaven. And it just kills those guys. And this is similar to what Elijah will do in the tribulation time period. It says in Revelation 11.5... And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeded out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So the same way Elijah calls down fire from heaven in Second Kings chapter 1, you see the two witnesses have fire proceeding out of their mouth. This is because they serve a God who is a consuming fire. Our God is a God of judgment. Our God is a consuming fire. Elijah was just a man who yielded himself to the power of an almighty God. In Deuteronomy 4.24 it says, For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire. In Deuteronomy 9.3 it says, Understand therefore this day that the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee as a consuming fire. He shall destroy them. In Hebrews 12.29 it says, For our God is a consuming fire. And in 2 Kings 1.10, And Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. So Elijah, there in chapter 1, is calling down fire from heaven on these people. And then in chapter 2, We serve a God that can remove you anytime he wants to. What a God we serve when he can remove you from this world any time that he wants to. In this chapter, the Lord takes Elijah out by a whirlwind. You know the story in Second Kings 2, 11 through 13. It says, And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, Behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. So Elijah was taken out because the Lord wanted to take him out. The Lord can take you out of this world anytime he wants to, whether it be through death or through the rapture. And when the Lord takes you out in the rapture, you will get a new body that can do greater things than anything Elijah or Elisha could do. You're going to have a body like him. Our, our vile body shall be fashioned like unto his glorious body, the Lord's body. So don't get worried about the power men have in this world. They may have more power than you do, but nothing like the Lord. Our God's a consuming fire. Our God can take me out of this world right now if he wanted to. He could kill me tomorrow if he wanted to. He could take out anybody that he wanted to. God isn't limited in what he can do. And Elijah sees Elijah go up. So now he actually gets a double portion of what Elijah had and does twice the miracles. And that's what you read about during the first part of 2 Kings is the miracles that Elisha goes around doing. In chapter 3, uh, God quenches thirst and uses Elisha to do it. One of Elijah's, Elisha's miracles is He's going to cause water to appear when there's no water around. And that's just like how the God we serve, God quenches your thirst when nothing else will. You see, the first part of this book really shows you the great miracles by Elisha. And here the Lord will use him to quench thirst miraculously. In 2 Kings 
3, 15 through 17, Elijah says, But now bring, bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. So when this music played, the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha. So that shows there's a good kind of music. There's a certain kind of music that's good. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, Make this valley full of ditches. For thus saith the Lord, You shall not see wind, neither shall you see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water, that ye may drink, both ye and your cattle and your beasts. So Elijah is going to cause water to appear. They had no chance of getting their thirst quenched without Elisha. You have no chance of getting your thirst quenched without Jesus Christ as salvation. And then after salvation, you got to get your thirst quenched by the word. Jesus said in John seven thirty eight, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Elijah quenched thirst miraculously. He made water show up when there was none. Jesus Christ will quench your thirst miraculously. He'll give you living water. Chapter 4. We serve a God who's more than you need. What a God we serve. He's more than you need. And here you have in chapter 4 another miracle by Elisha. And this is the story of Elisha and the widow's oil. And in 2 Kings 4, 6, and 7, And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. And then she came and told the man of God, and, said, and he said, Go, sell the oil, and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. She didn't think she had enough. But the Lord used Elisha to give her more than she needed. And Philippians 4.19 says, But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So when the vessels were full, she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. She had more than she needed. Just like the Lord gives us way more than we need. Chapter 5, nobody is perfect, but Jesus is. What a God we serve, he's perfect. And in this chapter, you're introduced to a character named Naaman. In 2 Kings 5, 1, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master, and honorable. Because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria, he was also a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. In this life, you see great men, strong men, rich men, but if you examine them, you'll find a but in there somewhere. Naaman was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. And you can do this with any man. You'll find a flaw, except for the God-man. Jesus Christ is almighty. He's the first and the last, but nothing. There's no flaw. There are no buts. The only buts about him only have to do with you. For example, but God commendeth his love toward us in that way while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But God, who is rich in mercy. That's the only but you can find about him is when it comes to you. You can't say Jesus Christ is perfect, but this and this and this because you can't find nothing bad about God. Naaman... He's a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. That's you. You may be good in a certain field. You may be good at doing something, but we always find a but in there about you. Probably a bunch of buts we don't even know about about you. But another miracle by Elijah is uh, he, he heals uh, Naaman's leprosy. He tells him to go wash himself seven times in the Jordan and when he comes back out, he'll be healed of it. And that's exactly what happened. Naaman didn't believe him at first, but he goes down there and tries it. And if leprosy pictures sin, and water pictures the word of God, then the picture is clear. You need the washing of water by the word. And a good preacher like Elijah will point you to the word. Elijah pointed Naaman to the water. A good preacher will point you to the word, because that's how you get cleansed. That's how you can get the sin off of you in your day-to-day -day life. Chapter 6. What a God we serve. And if it matters to you, if the things in your life matter to you, the little things, it matters to Him. And now you have the miracle of the floating axe head. 
Elisha and the miracle of the floating axe head, and what seems like a minor thing was something important to the man who lost the axe head. And it mattered enough to God for him to allow Elisha to perform a miracle. This shows me that the God we serve cares about the little things. In 2 Kings 6, 5-7, through 7, But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. So you see that. It was a little thing. Seems like a little thing to us, but to this guy it was a big thing. He said, it was borrowed. You know, I, I, I got to have this. You know, little things like this happen to us every day, and it's a big deal to us. And I believe that if it's a big deal to us and it's a big deal to God, and that God will help us even with these little things that we've got going on. And next, if God be for me, who can be against me? It says in 2 Kings six fifteen and 17, And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host can pass the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, to Elisha, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. So Elisha had this spirit world on his side, and he was not afraid of any army of horses and chariots, because he, he had spiritual horses and chariots all the way around him. If God be for us, who can be against us? Chapter 7, what a God we serve. He always seems to work things out. And in this story you have, it's the story about the lepers who thought they were done for. They thought they were done for any way they looked at it. But you're going to see that they weren't done for. In 2 Kings 7, 3 through 8, it says, And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit, he, sit we here until... We die. If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria. Behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the othermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. You see, they thought that they were just done for and dead, either, either way they looked at it. But the Lord tricked all those, all those guys so that they fled from all their stuff from their camp there. And then the lepers just came in and, and got some food and drink and everything else. You see, God worked it out for them. And that's just like me and you. Look at yourself right now. You've been through a lot, but you're still alive. You're still breathing. You're in your house or in your car or wherever you are listening to this. And think back about that time when you thought, oh, man, this is it. I'm done for. It's over. I'm not going to make it through this. You thought you wouldn't make it. And then now look at you. Now look down at yourself. You're here. You're in one piece. The Lord always seems to work it out. Remember, when you're going through that trial or whatever and you think it's over, the Lord worked it out for you all those other times, just like he worked it out for these lepers. Now, chapter 9. What a God we serve. A God who will punish the evil. Jezebel had had it coming for a while, and now she's about to get what she deserves. The enemies of God seem to be prospering now. But rest assured, they're going to get it in the neck. And in 2 Kings 9.30-32, through 32, 
It says, And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and tired her head and looked out at a window, so she's trying to seduce Jehu. And as Jehu entered in at the gate, she said, Had Zimri peace, who slew his master? And he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. And he said, Throw her down. So they threw her down. And some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses. And he trod her underfoot. And when he was come in, he did eat and drink and said, Go, see now this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. And they went to bury her, and they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Wherefore they came again and told him, and he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In the portion of Jezreel shall the dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field in the portion of Jezreel, so that they shall not say, This is Jezebel. So Jezebel got what was coming to her. Elijah had done prophesied that this was coming to her. And you know what? There's all of the, these promises, these prophecies of what's going to happen to the devil and the Antichrist and the false prophet and the workers of iniquity. Those promises are still coming to pass. Those promises are still going to happen. The devil is going to be cast into a bottomless pit. The Antichrist and the false prophet are going to be cast into the lake of fire. And then the devil will be cast into the lake of fire eventually. That stuff's coming to pass. Just as sure as Jezebel got ate up by those dogs, that's what's going to happen to your enemies. The devil, the false prophet, the antichrist, the workers of iniquity. What a God we serve. It looks like sometimes that evil is winning. I mean, you turn on the news, it looks like evil's winning. You turn on anything, it looks like evil's winning. But what a God we serve. He's... He's done one. He's in eternity right now. He's looking at this like it's a DVD or something. He can go backwards. He can go forwards. He can put it on pause, do whatever. He already knows that he's won. Now, chapter 10, what a God we serve. Why wouldn't you wholly follow the Lord? God wants men to wholly follow him. What a God we serve. Why wouldn't you want to? You see, Jehu, this man, he's had some victories for the Lord. He has, he's seen how serving the Lord pays off. And he's seen how serving Satan, like Jezebel, leads to a bloody death. Why wouldn't he wholly follow the Lord after witnessing these things? It says in 2 Kings ten twenty eight through 31, And thus Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel, howbeit for the, from the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, Jehu departed not from after them, to wit the golden calves that were in Bethel and that were in Dan. And the Lord said unto Jehu, Because thou hast done well in executing that which is right in mine eyes, and hast done unto the house of Ahab according to all that was in mine heart, thy children of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart, for he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin." So he's, he's doing all these things that all these failures did. Jeroboam, the biggest failure, the, the worst king that we've seen so far. And you need to learn from the mistakes of those before you. Or you're just going to repeat them like Jehu repeated the same sins of Jeroboam and the sons of Jeroboam and all those other men. Why would he repeat these same sins? Why would he not continue in victory? He had these victories, but he did not wholly follow the Lord. Why wouldn't you want to wholly follow the Lord? What a God we serve. If you've got some type of sin in your life, get rid of it and wholly follow the Lord. Do your best to surrender everything you got to God. Now, chapter 11. We got a good picture here with some of these kings, a picture of what's going to take place. You see, God will reign as king soon on the earth. In 2 Kings 11, 1 through 3, And when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal. And Jehoshaphat, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, 
took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons which were slain. And they hid him, even him and his nurse, in the bedchamber from Athaliah, so that he was not slain. And he was with her hid in the house of the Lord six years. And Athaliah did reign over the land. So just like Joash is hid until he gets to the throne, Jesus Christ is hid right now until he gets to the throne. You don't see him right now. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But one day you'll be able to physically see Jesus Christ reigning on the throne. What a God we serve. It looks like he's losing, but he's really winning. And in Second Kings eleven twenty through 21, and all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was in quiet, and they slew Athaliah with the sword beside the king's house, seven years old was Joash when he began to reign. Now, chapter 12, what a God we serve, who gives gifts unto men. We serve a God that, that not only gives us a Bible, our physical needs, our comfort, but also gave men who can instruct us in the ways of the Lord. Now, Second Kings 12, 2, And Jehoash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all his days, wherein Jehoiada, the priest, instructed him. Notice he did right in the sight of the Lord when Jehoiada instructed him. The Lord gave pastors and teachers as gifts to the body of Christ today, just like he gave Jehoiada, the priest, Je to Jehoash. And the Lord gives us pastors and teachers as gifts so that you can follow instructions from them and live in righteousness. In 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture... It's given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You see, God puts it on the heart of men to dig in the Bible and get as close to God as they possibly can so that they can come to you and then help you uh, learn the scriptures, help you get in, in, inspired and excited about the word of God so that you will live a life of righteousness yourself. Jehoash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all his days, wherein Jehoiada the priest instructed him. Chapter 13, God can use people after their death. What a God we serve. We serve a God that is so powerful that if a person allows the Lord to work through them while they're alive, then they'll be even used of God after death. They'll be even used of God after their death. In 2 Kings thirteen fourteen, it said, Now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness, whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, O my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. So Elijah, he's fallen sick of his sickness and he dies in verse 14. But then look down at verse 21. And it came to pass as they were burying a man that, behold, they spied a band of men, and they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. So they throw this guy, this body in the, in the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. What a crazy, interesting story. This person revived to life after touching the dead bones of Elisha. Look at all the great preachers who are dead and gone, and yet they're still being used by the Lord. Look at all the answered prayers that, it, that happened after a person that prayed the prayer died. Elijah's bones brought someone to life after he was dead. Uh, there's stories of Preachers who were dead and somebody listened to a dead preacher's sermon and got saved. People are still learning the Bible by listening to the studies and sermons and reading the books of dead preachers and teachers. And they're still learning from these men that have been dead for a hundred years. You see, if you allow God to use you now, he can use you after you're dead. What a God we serve. Chapter 14, what a God we serve, who you could never match the righteousness of him. 
In 2 Kings 14, 1 through 3, in the second year of Joash, son of Jehoahaz, king of Israel, reigned Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah. He was twenty and five years old when he began to reign, and reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jehoadan of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, yet not like David his father. You will notice a common theme in these books of the kings, and that is the kings are commonly compared to David. He is the standard. He is the standard for the kings. Just like Jesus Christ is our standard. For a man to get eternal life, he would have to be as righteous as the standard. One problem. The Bible says there is none righteous. So at salvation, the Lord gives you the righteousness of Jesus Christ freely, even though you don't deserve it, even though you're unrighteous. He takes your permanent record, takes out the bad stuff that's on it, and puts the righteousness of Jesus Christ in there. That way you can meet the standard. That way, in it, eternally speaking, your record, it says you did that which was right, just like Jesus Christ. You got Jesus Christ's record on there, a perfect sinless record. You see, Jesus Christ is your standard, just like David, King David, was the standard that these kings were compared to. Joash did good, but not as good as David. You may do good in this life, but you could never be as good as Jesus Christ. Chapter 15, what a God we serve, a God that's a jealous God. In 2 Kings 15, 1 through 4, in the 20 and 7th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, began Azariah, son of Amaziah, king of Judah, to reign. Sixteen years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned two and fifty years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jecoliah of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done, save that the high places were not removed. The people sacrificed and burned incense still on the high places. So those high places... And another rare thing here, a king that did right in the sight of the Lord. It's always a rare thing when they do right in the sight of the Lord. However, there's one problem. He hadn't removed those high places. God is a jealous God. He doesn't want the high places in your life. He doesn't want to share you. You see, they would go to these high places and worship false gods. That's what these high places were about. They'd go up there, they'd worship false gods, uh, Give them offerings and sacrifices. But the Bible says God is a jealous God. He doesn't want to share you with other gods. In Exodus thirty four fourteen, it says, For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Examine your life. Remove the high places from your life and replace it with something godly because God is a jealous God. Chapter 16, what a God we serve, an almighty God who cares about children. In 2 Kings 16, 1 through 3, it says, In the seventeenth year of Pekah, the son of Ramaliah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty years old was Ahaz when he began to reign, and reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem, and did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord his God, like David his father. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, yea, and made his son to pass through the fire, according to the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel. So this satanic king sacrificed children to his false gods. That's what it means when it says, made his son to pass through the fire. That's a child sacrifice. But we serve a God that cares about children, that hates that stuff. And he told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, but he would never have had Abraham to go through with the act. He was just doing that to show the devil that his own children, God's own children, loves God just as much as the devil's people love him. We serve a God that cares about innocent children. The God of this world, the devil, wants to abort children. He wants to traffic children. He wants the children sacrificed to him. He wants you to pass your son or daughter through the fire. He wants to sexualize them. The most mistreated people in America is not black people. It's not white people. It's not any race of people. It's young people of all races, black, white, whatever. That's the people that's being truly mistreated because that's the people that really can't 
you know, stick up for theirself. You know, a baby in its mother's womb, he can't do much to defend himself. These little children that are being abducted can't really do much to defend themselves. And cowards like to go after something that can't really defend theirself. But we serve an almighty God that loves children and all this stuff is being marked down. None of it's going to go unpunished. Just like Jesus said in Luke eighteen sixteen, And Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. What a God we serve. A God that cares about little children. When it seems like people around you don't. And the God of this world certainly doesn't. Then in chapter 17, you see the captivity of the northern tribes taken by Assyria. And God will also chasten his people. You see, God will raise up enemies against people, against his own people as a judgment on them to get them to come back to him, just like he did in the book of Judges. So that you got the captivity of the northern tribes taken by Assyria. But today, even in your life, when you get out of line, God can raise up an adversary against you, maybe somebody at your workplace, maybe even your own spouse, and the Lord will use them to chastise you, to get you back in line, to get you where you're going to seek Him in prayer. It says in Hebrews 12, 6 through 8, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he of whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, Whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Think about where God brought you from. The Lord brought Israel out from under the bondage of Egypt, but they end up going in the ways of the heathen still. There are consequences to sin in this life. You are saved from your sins eternally, but if you live for the world, you will suffer the consequences in this life, just like they suffered the consequences. Chapter 18, what a God we serve. God is someone you can have complete trust in, just like this good king, a rare good king, Hezekiah. It says in 2 Kings 18, 5, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel. The thing that made Hezekiah great was that he trusted in the Lord God. That's what's lacking today. People are trusting in uncertain riches, in their career, in their spouse, in their false God. King Hezekiah, he trusted in the Lord. And it says in verse 3 of 2 Kings 18, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Don't you just love it when you're reading about these kings and finally you get somebody you can root for, somebody that you can kind of get something from? He did right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, did. So, wow, he's 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 uh, almost meeting the standard here, according to all that David, his father, did. He removed the high places and break the images, and cut down the groves, and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. So you remember that serpent that Moses made back there in Numbers that uh, the people could look to and get healed after they got snake bit? People ended up taking that thing and worshiping it. He had to get rid of it. And he trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. So Hezekiah, great king. Why was he great? Because he trusted in the Lord. Trust in the Lord, and you can do great things. Now, chapter 19. What a God we serve. A God you can go to instantly in prayer. And I'm sure you know the story. Hezekiah, he's sick unto death. The prophet Isaiah comes to him and says, set, thou, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. And you know, Hezekiah prays. And the Lord adds 15 years to his life. Hezekiah trusted the Lord and went to him in prayer. And we can go to God in prayer even easier than Hezekiah. Because we got the Lord Jesus Christ. God lives in me and I'm in him. 
I have instant access to the Lord anytime that I want. Hebrews 4.16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If Hezekiah can turn to the Lord and pray and get 15 more years added to his life, I believe we can easily turn to the Lord and get prayers answered. Chapter 21, what a God we serve, a God that will save anybody. You know, Hezekiah got 15 extra years. He went on to have a son named Manasseh. And he would become the most wicked king Judah ever had, probably. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Hephzibah. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And in verse 9, but they, it says, And Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. Not only did he do evil, but he seduced people to do evil as well. A wicked king led to wicked people. He made every faith acceptable except the worship of the true God of Israel. And he put idols in the place of the one true God. Yet, what do we read about him in Second Chronicles 33, 12 through 13? We read that God will save anybody, even Manasseh. It says in Second Chronicles 33, 12 and 13, And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him. And he was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. Even though Manasseh was into child sacrifice, devil worship, and all kinds of perversions, the Lord heard him. The Lord heard his cry. What a God we have. Thank God he is like he is. And he's not some evil God who's just going to burn all of us up. But then in chapter 22, you have one of the greatest kings, and that is Josiah. What a God we serve. A God who gave us a book. It says in 2 Kings 22, 1 and 2, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 30 and one years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jedidah, Jedidah the daughter of Adiah of Bosketh, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in all the way of David his fathers, and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. So another great king walked in all the way of David his father's father, and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. And I wonder why. We'll look at verse 13. He says, Go ye, inquire of the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that is found. You see, Josiah found the book. And he said, For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book, to do according unto all that is writ which is written concerning us. The words of God made Josiah realize he needed to change some things. He came in and cleaned house. Look at Second Kings 23, 4 through 7. And the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest and the priests of the second order and the keepers of the door to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal and for the grove and for all the host of heaven. He burned them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kedron and carried the ashes of them unto Bethel. So getting in the book, when Josiah found the book, he got rid of the junk, got rid of the idols. He got rid of the stuff for Baal. And then it says, And he put down the idolatrous priests, whom the kings of Judah had obtained to burn incense, had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah. He got rid of all these fake men of God. And in the places round about Jerusalem, them also there, them that burned incense into Baal, to the sun and to the moon and to the planets and to all the host of heaven. And he brought them out the grove, he brought out the grove from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem and to the brook Kedron and burned it at the brook Kedron and stamped it to small powder and cast the powder thereof upon the graves of the children of the people. And he brake down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord where the women wove hangings for the grove. Man, look at what the book caused him to do. He is cleaning the house. And notice that a mark of a good king, they get rid of the sodomites. They get the sodomites out of the land. He broke down the houses of the sodomites. So when you see a president or a ruler 
who's in favor of the LGBT stuff, you got somebody that's not doing right in the sight of the Lord. You, we should be against that. It's against the Bible. But the book, God gave us a book. And if we read it, then we'll do right in the sight of the Lord. What made Josiah great? He found the book. What made Hezekiah great? He trusted in the Lord. What do you get when you get in the book? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You're going to have faith. You're going to begin to trust in what God said the more you get in the book. 2 Kings 23, 29 through 30. In his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up against the king of Syria, Assyria to the river Euphrates, and King Josiah went against him, and he slew at Megiddo when he had seen him. And he slew him at Megiddo when he had seen him. And his servants carried him in a chariot dead from Megiddo, and brought him to Jerusalem, and buried him in his own sepulcher. And the people of the land took Jehoaz, the son of Josiah, and anointed him, and made him king in his father's stead. So Josiah, a good king, he found the book. And he loved the book and fought for the Lord until he died. He finished his course. Josiah ends up dying in battle. This should remind us to fight until the very end. Paul said in Second Timothy 4, 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. But now in chapter 24, you're going to see Judah go into captivity. In 2 Kings 24, 18, or 24, 8 through 11, Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. And his mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of El Nathan of Jerusalem, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father had done. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city, and his servants did besiege it. So Zedekiah ends up being made king by Nebuchadnezzar. But Zedekiah also rebels against Nebuchadnezzar. And he's going to end up with a tragic end himself. In 2 Kings 25, 7, And they slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, and put out the eyes of Zedekiah, and bound him with fetters of brass, and carried him to Babylon. So the God of the Bible is the only way to be free from the fetters and chains of this world. If Zedekiah had done right, if a bunch of these other kings had done right, they wouldn't have been in this mess. It's the only way to keep your eyes open so that you won't be blinded by the God of this world like Zedekiah had his eyes taken out. The only way you're not going to be blinded is be like Josiah. Bring the book out. Open the book. Trust the Lord like Hezekiah. You know, be zealous and want a double portion like Elisha. Be like some of these good characters that we've read about. But here you've seen the fall of Israel. You've seen the fall of Judah. And it was all because they did not live for the Lord. They did not turn to the Lord God. But what a God we serve. Who does justice. He's fair and right. Everything he does is right. Everything we do is wrong unless we're doing what he wants us to do. But this has been the book of Second Kings.